Good morning. We're here to give an update on COVID-19 and the state's plan for delivering booster shots. I'm joined by Rachel Banks, Public Health Director at the Oregon Health Authority, Dr. Tom Jean, Deputy State Health Officer, and Colt Gill, Director of the Oregon Department of Education. I wanna start our COVID update with some promising news. Our hospitalizations are declining with 822 as of today. Cases are slowly declining as well. I know this isn't the fall that any of us had hoped for or expected. At the end of June, we were hopeful our communities would be largely free of COVID-19. Unfortunately, Delta changed everything. The good news is that while we still have a long way to go, it appears things are slowly getting better. And every day there is renewed hope as we see more people getting vaccinated, progress on vaccines for our five to 11 year olds, and now the beginning of boosters for some of our most vulnerable. Thank you to everyone who is getting vaccinated and wearing your mask. Your efforts are truly saving lives. Last week, the FDA and the CDC shared their recommendations for the first large group of Americans who are eligible for booster shots. The Western States Scientific Work Group followed with their recommendation, which aligns with the federal guidance and which Oregon will be following. Oregonians who received the Pfizer vaccine at least six months ago that are now eligible to receive a booster shot include seniors, people living in long-term care facilities, people with underlying medical conditions, and people who are at higher risk of COVID-19 exposure and transmission due to occupational or institutional setting. Director Banks will go into more detail. If you're in one of these groups, you can schedule an appointment today. Director Banks will share more details about how the state is prepared to administer boosters. We have free and readily available vaccines across the state. Everyone who is eligible for a booster will get one. For those who have received the Moderna or J&J &J vaccine, like myself, I ask for your patience as we wait for further data and guidance from the federal government. For those who received the Pfizer vaccine but are not yet eligible for a booster, please know that you are still well protected from COVID-19. Boosters offer an extra layer of protection, and that is really important for individuals at higher risk of exposure or illness, but you are still fully vaccinated with the two doses. The nation's top scientists and doctors continue to monitor this virus and evaluate the data. As millions of people are getting vaccinated around the world each day, we are constantly receiving new information. I'm so grateful for their dedication to consistently examining the data, and I am confident they will continue to update us. We continue to see the powerful effectiveness of all three vaccines. We also continue to see how dangerous COVID remains for those who are unvaccinated. Vaccines continue to be the key to putting this pandemic behind us. Thank you to everyone who is having one-on-one -on -one conversations with family and friends who have questions. Thanks to all the Oregonians stepping up and getting vaccinated and wearing your masks. Thank you to our healthcare workers for working around the clock to save lives. We will get through this as we always do together. Over to you, Director Banks. Thank you, Governor Brown. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Rachel Banks. Public Health Director for the Oregon Health Authority, and I use she, her, and her pronouns. This morning, I wanna provide you with additional details about who is eligible for the Pfizer vaccine booster that was approved last week, and how these booster doses are rolling out with, around the state. The decision by the US Food and Drug Administration on September 22nd to amend the emergency use authorization for Pfizer's COVID-19 vac COVID vaccine which allowed the use of a single booster dose for certain populations. The decision was highly anticipated and certainly welcome here as the Delta variant continues to ravage Oregon and the rest of the country. 
the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, followed the FDA's decision with its own endorsement of the Pfizer booster on September 23rd. And finally, the next day, the Western States Scientific Safety Review Workgroup made its own confirmation of the booster and recommended its use to Governor Brown and the governors of Washington, California, and Nevada. It's important to note that the FDA and the CDC's decisions affect specific groups that are at higher risk of severe illness and death from COVID-19. They recommend the Pfizer booster six months after completing the Pfizer vaccine series for those who are age 65 and older, living in a long-term care facility, and age 50 to 64 with underlying medical conditions. The Western State Scientific Safety Review Workgroup expanded on the federal recommendation supporting the use of the Pfizer booster after six months of completing the Pfizer vaccine series among people 18 to 64 who have underlying medical conditions and who are in occupational or institutional settings that put them at a higher risk of COVID-19 exposure and transmission. These settings include healthcare settings. So for healthcare workers, first responders, such as firefighters and police and congregant care staff. Those who work in educational settings, such as teachers, support staff, and daycare workers, food and agricultural workers, manufacturing workers, those who work in correction settings, the U.S. Postal Service, along with public transit workers and grocery store workers. In short, people who are in phases of 1A and 1B during organs rollout of the primary COVID-19 vaccinations last December and throughout earlier this year are now eligible to receive the Pfizer booster if they want it and if they received their immunization at least six months ago. People may remember in Oregon, our phase 1A and 1B prioritization included all patient-facing healthcare staff, such as food service and housekeeping staff at hospitals and not just medical workers. We included workers who treat high-risk patients in outpatient substance use treatment programs, those who provide non-emergency medical transportation or work in hospices. We included those with intellectual and developmental disabilities and those who care for them. And we adjusted our phase one rollout to make it concurrent to simplify the process so that all eligible workers would be eligible at once instead of having to wait in a prioritized line. Our expanded definition and our revised schedule are a demonstration of our continued commitment to equity and were intended to protect our most vulnerable residents and those and to reduce health inequities. I want to remind everyone who fits in these original categories and received a Pfizer vaccine more than six months ago, you are eligible today. Please talk to your health care provider and consider getting a booster shot. As a public health leader supporting OHA's effort to end health inequities in Oregon by 2030, I'm encouraged by the Western States work group's alignment with the CDC and acknowledging the effects of long-standing health and social inequities on the risk of severe COVID illness from COVID-19, particularly among our Black, Indigenous, people of color, and tribal communities. The work group's recommendation that social determinants of vulnerability be included in the assessment of medical conditions that qualify individuals for booster doses will help us ensure that these communities that have so tragically shouldered an unfair burden during this pandemic are prioritized to receive the booster. Oregon is looking at how we take these factors into account so we can prevent our booster program from suffering some of the same inequities that we've seen in the rollout of the initial doses. Now I'd like to touch briefly on the rollout of the Pfizer booster and vaccine supply in Oregon. At this time, the supply of the Pfizer vaccine in Oregon is strong. There are more than 800,000 doses of the Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson vaccines, including more than 400,000 Pfizer doses that are available in inventories across the state. At this time, we estimate that approximately 300,000 people are currently eligible for a Pfizer booster. Oregon Health Authority and the Centers for Disease Control are watching vaccine orders closely based on each site's reporting about their inventory and utilization. Using those criteria, we're able to maintain in vaccination sites anywhere from two to four weeks supply of vaccine, whether they're for boosters, first or second doses. Vaccines continue to come from federally purchased supplies directly to vaccination provider sites, 
or in some cases, um, from the regional vaccine redistribution hubs that OHA has set up to serve every part of the state. As a result, we don't anticipate any challenges for people who qualify and want to get the Pfizer booster, or for anyone who is currently unvaccinated who wants any of the doses of the three available vaccines. We continue to see good access for people seeking vaccination appointments or who simply want to drop in and get their shot. The larger concern is ensuring the capacity of clinics, pharmacies, local public health systems, and other vaccinators to manage the logistics of serving vaccination sites and ensuring access across the general population and focus settings to reach the people seeking vaccine doses when they want them. OHA's vaccine operations team continues to engage with these vaccination sites and is looking at whether staff brought into Oregon to cover the surge in hospitalizations can be maintained to add workforce capacity to our fall vaccination efforts. We're also engaging with local public health authorities and community-based organizations to identify locations and potential operators as needed for larger scale vaccination sites. We'd want these sites in or very near neighborhoods that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. And we're also working with organizers to incorporate child-friendly services wherever possible, anticipating that there may be authorizations for ages five to 11 sometime this fall. So if you're eligible and you want to get the Pfizer booster, I encourage you to visit getvaccinatedoregon.gov to find a vaccine clinic near you. If you're not yet eligible for the Pfizer booster, if you're among the high-risk groups, but it hasn't been at least six months since completing your Pfizer vaccine series, we ask that you be patient and wait your turn. And if you've completed the first and second doses of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines, or the single dose of Johnson & Johnson vaccine, congratulations. Even without a vaccine booster, you are still considered fully vaccinated and very well protected from COVID-19. Finally, I wanna echo the words of the CDC director, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, who emphasized that the Pfizer booster, while an important step in providing additional protection to the most vulnerable, is no replacement for continuing our work to help people who are unvaccinated get their first and second doses of the vaccine. As she told reporters last week, we will not boost our way out of this pandemic. 78% of Oregon adults have been vaccinated so far, and that's an important step in reaching the critical threshold that we need to loosen COVID-19's grip on our state. But we can do even better and more equitably. So we need everyone who has not yet been vaccinated to do so at their earliest opportunity. Getting vaccinated along with continuing to wear masks, keeping our distance from others and avoiding gatherings is quite simply our state's ticket out of this pandemic. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Tom Jean. Thank you, Director Banks. The pandemic in Oregon appears to have reached its peak. Daily infections and hospitalizations are slowly receding from the record highs that we experienced earlier in the month. However, our ability to sustain this welcome trend depends on more Oregonians getting vaccinated on all of us continuing to wear masks in indoor public spaces and outdoors among crowds, and reconsidering plans that put us or others at high risk of getting COVID-19. The recent data suggests that our collective efforts are having the desired effect. As of yesterday, our seven-day average of daily cases was 1,646. The same average on September 1st was 2,200. We are seeing a corresponding drop in the percentage of positive tests from 12% to 8.9% over the same period. Our most recent COVID-19 weekly report for the week ending September 19th tallied 11,655 new cases, a 10% decline, and that followed an 11% drop during the previous week and marked the three, third uh, straight weekly decrease. COVID-19 related hospitalizations were slightly lower than the previous week, but COVID-19 related deaths increased by 23% from 120 to 148. Thank you, Oregonians, for once again, unselfishly stepping up to turn back the rising tide of infection. Your collective effort has eased the stress on our hospitals across the state. But despite the recent easing, we still have far too many COVID-19 patients occupying hospital beds, 823 statewide, which is hundreds more than our previous peak last November. We are recording more than 800 daily hospitalizations every day. Intensive care admissions account for nearly 25% of that total. 
Neither trend is sustainable, and we must all continue to do our part to ensure that there are enough available beds for everyone who experiences a medical emergency or needs hospital care. Our latest modeling report shows how fragile progress can be against this unrelenting virus. The report shows that earlier this month, the spread of the virus increased slightly. That was the result of a slow but discernible increase in high-risk behaviors and a slacking adherence to uh, the public health protocols that have proven to be effective. We cannot drop our guard and risk a resurgence that could overwhelm our healthcare system. Our healthcare workers and resources have been severely strained for far too long. Director Banks earlier outlined the steps our state is taking to quickly and efficiently make booster shots available to everyone who needs one. I urge everyone who meets the criteria to receive a booster dose uh, to talk to your healthcare providers about getting one. If you're not eligible for a Pfizer booster or you've received a Moderna or Johnson & Johnson vaccine, there is no need to worry. The data shows and all the supporting science indicates that all the available vaccines provide excellent protection against serious illness and death from COVID-19. We must not lose sight of our primary goal, which is to vaccinate as many adult Oregonians as possible. The Delta variant remains a formidable threat to all of us, and most especially to people who have not been vaccinated and who still account for an overwhelming majority of the COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths in Oregon. According to our latest uh, breakthrough case report, the rate of COVID-19 in unvaccinated people is approximately four times higher than in vaccinated people. You may ask why, if the vaccine is working, are some vaccinated people getting sick? Well, unless a vaccine is 100% effective, so long as the virus is circulating, some vaccinated people will get sick. And the more vaccinated people there are, the more breakthrough cases we can expect to see. So that increasing number is primarily an indication that we're seeing more vaccinated people. The vast majority of the breakthrough cases in vaccinated people results in either mild symptoms or none at all. That's the good news. Here's the bad news. If you're unvaccinated, you've never been more vulnerable to being sickened by the virus, passing the virus on to your loved ones, getting seriously ill or dying from COVID-19. If you are unvaccinated, you are risking the health of your family, your loved ones, and everyone you encounter while infected. COVID-19 vaccines are saving lives in Oregon every day. More than 2.7 million Oregonians have had at least one dose of the vaccine, and nearly 2.5 million have completed a vaccine series. To those of you who have taken the effort and made a plan to, to get vaccinated, thank you. And now I will turn things back over to Governor Brown. Thank you, Dr. Jean. Really appreciate you joining us today, Dr. Banks. It's great to have you here as well and really appreciative of Director Gill taking time out of his busy schedule. With that, Charles, we're ready for questions. Issues on our end, so you may not see the governor's video feed, but it sounds like our audio is working okay. Um, we'll go to Mike Zacchino first for questions with KDRV. Uh, thank you. Um, this is a question probably probably best uh, for um, Doc, or Director Banks or Dr. Jane. Uh, people who have had COVID-19 have asked why they need to get a vaccine since presumably they are now protected against COVID-19. Um, can Dr. Jane, can uh, Dr. Jane or Director Banks answer why the vaccine is necessary even for those who have had? COVID-19. Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, I can address that. Um, you know, yeah, we are seeing some emerging evidence that, uh, that uh, people who have uh, COVID-19 infections that, um, do have some level of immunity and develop some level of immunity to the virus. Uh, what I can tell you is right now that evidence is not clear enough and it's not solid enough for us to, uh, to really rely on it. Um, and we also know that uh, with all the studies that have been done um, in, in millions of people uh, who have now gotten the vaccine worldwide, uh, we, have, we know very well the level of immunity that we can expect from the vaccines, and we know that they're very safe. Um, uh, and they're safe in people who have already had COVID-19 infection. Those people, in fact, will, will have extremely robust immunity uh, if they get the vaccine after having had the infection. So uh, we will continue to, to reevaluate uh, evidence as it comes out. 
uh, but but for now we're really focused on the the, the clear evidence that we have uh, for the vaccine uh, induced immunity. Um, the other concern is that it's it's difficult to to assess the whole range of immunity from somebody who might have had very mild infection or no symptoms at all, all the way up to somebody who may have been in the hospital or ICU. Um, those may actually result in different levels of immunity, and it's it would be difficult to. Uh, to operationalize or, or assess uh, how, how to uh, account for that uh, at this time. But we'll continue to uh, reevaluate. Thanks, Mike. We'll go next to uh, Kelly Azar with K2. Go ahead, Kelly. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, I have a question for Governor Brown. It's a two-part question for Governor Brown and um, Hopefully, I believe Colt Gill from ODE is on this call, but I couldn't see him, so I apologize if I'm wrong or right. Um, my question is about schools. We've seen a number of schools have to close their doors, go back to distance learning with just a handful of cases, maybe even less than that, but it's the quarantines that is causing the stress on the systems. Are we making any adjustments to ensure that kids don't have to by the hundreds quarantine or schools don't have to get interrupted like they did up here in Reynolds uh, High School just a couple weeks ago? And then my other question is with the vaccine deadline looming, we're less than a month away for teachers. How are we going to handle that? How are schools being directed to handle that if come October 18th, the teachers are not vaccinated? To turn both of those questions over to Director Gill, and uh, I'll back clean up if needed. Director Gill. Great. Um, thank you, Governor Brown. Um, so to the first question, I do want to make clear, Oregon has over 1,300 uh, public and private schools, and we've only had to date about four schools that have closed their doors entirely and gone to distance learning for a short period of time. Um, during that time, they have both allowed those students and staff members who were close contacts to move through their quarantine period, but they have also um, reviewed their protocols so that when they come back into that space, uh, they are better able to reduce the number of students who may get quarantined um, if another COVID case enters the school. Um, the uh, schools across the state are very different. So we have urban schools uh, that um, hold a lot of students and serve uh, many stu students in a tight community. We also have rural schools that um, sometimes don't have nearly as many students in a classroom. The protocols need to look different in those spaces. And so we have uh, provided guidance. Um, we are issuing our, our later this week, our second school health advisory in um, partnership with the Oregon Health Authority um, that will actually name for schools that they need to review the layered mitigation protocols that they have in place. Um, and to review how they are implementing each of those protocols. For example, um, we call for physical distancing in schools. That is one of the things that helps reduce the number of uh, students who would get quarantined. Um, physical distancing has all kinds of subsets of uh, efforts that can be applied in a school setting. Um, schools are oftentimes using seating charts in classrooms to ensure that they know what students were in close contact with each other, uh, but we're asking them to review that in other settings as well, like school buses, like the cafeterias, um, like the carpet time that uh, schools hold, so that they always know who's in close contact and they don't end up quarantining more students than they need to. Um, quarantining is one of the great challenges of the school year, and it relates to your second question as well. So as we approach October 18th, um, the challenge with staffing may be exacerbated to some degree, but we have a staffing challenge in our schools right now that we're trying to overcome. And the staffing challenge is that unvaccinated staff members who are exposed to COVID-19 must quarantine. Vaccinated staff members do not need to quarantine unless they are symptomatic. So the more school staff that we get quarantined, the more able we will be able to keep our school doors open to in-person instruction because we will have the staff necessary to serve our students. So that's our aim with the October 18th date that we're holding to. Can I ask a quick follow-up on the, on the distancing aspect of it? We talked ahead, earlier Kelly. this summer a number of times about how the, the goal was to limit the number of quarantines and the masking, the distancing of three feet were 
were steps that would limit that. We're seeing, I mean, here in Reynolds, over a hundred more than that students had to quarantine. What went wrong? And do we need to reassess as a whole, as opposed to individual districts reassessing their mitigation plans? I think you look to the evidence. So um, Reynolds is one of hundreds of high schools in Oregon that closed again temporarily, uh, both to uh, serve those students during their quarantine period and to rethink their protocols. Um, but we have hundreds of schools that are open and have remained open and have worked through these challenges. So the keys are to um, make sure that every uh, student who's eligible um, and staff member who's eligible gets vaccinated that eliminates quarantines for the, um, to the greatest extent. Ensuring that everybody is masked in that setting greatly reduces the number of students who will end up getting quarantined because it allows students to be closer together in those indoor settings. Um, the third one is uh, physical distancing and thinking about cohorts. So the closer that uh, schools can track um, who students are in contact with and can limit um, the amount of time they're in contact, so for high schools, this means things like seating charts in classrooms, on buses, um, and even in the cafeterias during mealtime. It also means adjusting those transition times so that they're shorter, so there isn't opportunity for students to be um, within close contact for 15 cumulative minutes during the school day, um, and still try to operate school in as normal a way as possible for our students. Now, our educators across the state are doing a tremendous job of implementing these kinds of um, protocols in the schools and thinking through how they can work in each setting. That's exactly what Reynolds is doing during their um, closure. And when they come back, they'll have more of these protocols in place to help ensure that they can maintain in-person instruction. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. We'll go next to Gary Warner with EO Media. Go ahead, Gary. Gary, are you able to unmute? Uh, we'll come back to Gary. We'll go next to Imi Green with the Oregonian. Go ahead, Imi. Thank you. I have two areas of questions. I'll be brief. I'll try to be brief. Um, the rates of COVID-19 cases that we know of are flat um, from a week ago. So we've seen a change um, over the past several weeks, generally declining, but over the past week, um, not declining. Is it too early to declare that um, we're getting over this surge? Um, and along those lines, have you been able to trace the reason that cases might be flat for the past week? Um, have you been able to trace cases other than the Pendleton Roundup, which I understand did spark new cases? Um, have you been able to case trace cases to UO, OSU football games, the state fair, um, and high school football games. There's many, many of those going on despite ODE and the governor's request a few weeks ago asking people to refrain from extracurricular activities. Dr. Jean, I'm gonna turn that question over to you. Thank you, Governor. Um, I mean, that's the, there's a lot there and I think that kind of highlights, uh, you know, what's what we're facing right now. We have schools recently reopened, we have uh, colleges, universities recently reopened, we have uh, large events like the Roundup. Um, and so uh, could, could all those things be having some effect on our cases and potentially slowing the decline we're seeing? Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, we are seeing some, uh, um, you know, increase in some types of outbreaks, but they're pretty, not, nothing that I would be too concerned about at this point. Um, and it, it's also a little bit early because all those things that I mentioned, like school starting, uh, it takes a little while. It's not just something you're going to see in the first week or two. Uh, it takes a while for some of those to really uh, have an effect if they are going to have an effect. Um, but overall, we're, we're pretty happy with the trend we're seeing so far in declining cases and, and certainly in declining hospitalizations. Um, and our modeling, uh, as well as OHSU's modeling, is indicating that we're, we're hopefully going to continue to see um, uh, declines over the next couple months. But, you know, it all depends on what Oregonians are doing. And, and again, getting vaccinated uh, and, and wearing masks, and, and even though we're all tired of it, really uh, uh, sticking to those as, as well as you can are, are really going to be key to getting us out and getting us back down to a, a low level of cases. So, Dr. Jean, you haven't been able to trace or you have been able to trace cases to those football games. 
or other events? Uh, I have, I do not have information on that. I have not heard of any trace uh, particular uh, tracing related to a particular um, uh, sporting event uh, or other situation. Uh, for the Pendleton Roundup, um, that that ended a few days ago, um, and you know that it's a very large outdoor event, um, and there may not have been great compliance with masking there. So uh, we we do expect to see some impact on cases from that, but uh, it's still really too early to know the full extent of that. Okay, thank you. Just really quickly, this might be for the governor or for Director Gill. Um, we're three to four weeks into the school year and 75% of school districts aren't enrolled in the state's asymptomatic weekly testing program of students. Within those districts that are enrolled, many, many, many of them haven't started testing students weekly, um, to students who don't have symptoms. For example, Portland, Beaverton, Hillsboro, even though they're enrolled, they're not testing students yet. Um, how big a problem do you see that is? That, that is, how do we know um, how many cases, how much transmission there is in school because students especially so often don't show symptoms and they could be spreading it to their families or the wider community. How big a problem well, is that? I mean, I mean, my priority obviously is to keep kids uh, learning in the classrooms and we can certainly minimize disruptions to classroom learning by ensuring the adults around our students are fully vaccinated against COVID. And um, we, as Dr. Jean just said, it's incredibly important that adults in the community continue um, to wear masks and get vaccinated. And that's how we can drive down community rates. So that will assist our school children. And we're obviously exploring expanded use of testing and other tools uh, with our school districts. Um, I'll let uh, Director Gill uh, respond uh, further. Um, thank you, Governor. I agree. Uh, this is a valuable tool to help keep in-person instruction going. We do want more schools to sign up uh, for this service and think about the best ways to use it uh, to ensure continued operation of in-person learning and understand uh, where they may have gaps in their sets of protocols. Um, I think that this is a system that will become more important as we head into winter. So at this, at this time, our schools are doing incredible work um, and doing a lot to really limit the number of students who are um, impacted by COVID-19 and possibly quarantined. But as we head into winter and everyone in Oregon is spending more time as we've noticed this, this week with the rainfall coming in the, uh, this fall, uh, more folks will spend more time indoors. Um, and that's when we need uh, these other kinds of tools to be able to kick in um, and really support in-person instruction. Uh, so we'll be making calls um, to our districts to, again, consider this opportunity. We'll be working closely with the Oregon Health Authority on the implementation um, and ensuring that all the testing lab partners are ready to um, support uh, additional testing in our schools. That's our goal moving forward. Again, thinking about more students spending more time indoors um, it, this winter and using this as another tool to help support in-person instruction. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Uh, it looks like we have Gary Warner back from EO Media. Um, Gary, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Governor, uh, I, I'm surprised uh, that uh, you folks haven't heard of uh, the large spike out in Eastern Oregon off of the um, Pendleton Roundup. Uh, it was reported in Eastern Oregonian and in uh, papers in Southwestern um, Washington, we're seeing some huge spikes out there uh, that public officials are reporting and are also showing up in the uh, uh, County COVID-19 Community Transmission Report from OHA this week. Um, you're seeing uh, four times more cases in Grant County. You're seeing 60% up in Umatilla. You're seeing Harney, Walla, places like that that are, that are really spiking and they're basically being buried in the overall numbers by good numbers in the uh, Willamette Valley and sharply declining from extraordinarily high numbers in places like Josephine Jackson County. I wanna know if you are concerned that this could be a set off for another wave. This is how the last wave started, which was the uh, Whiskey Fest out in Umatilla. 
And I, I just don't get a sense of, uh, of concern about what's going on or knowledge about what's going on out there. Gary, let me be really, really clear. Um, I did not go to the Pendleton Roundup, which I love doing. I love riding in the parade with the governor's guard. I did not go because I was concerned about community spread. And I am well aware that we are seeing a spike in cases in Umatilla County and Walla Walla, uh, not Walla, Walla Walla, Washington, yes, Wallawa County um, as a result of the Pendleton Roundup. It is a little early. Um, uh, the roundup, my recollection, ended sep September 19th. Um, so I am very, very concerned. We know that our rural communities more generally are more medically vulnerable, do not have uh, the extensive healthcare capacity that we have in Metro Oregon. And honestly, uh, very concerned about the capacity of healthcare workers themselves. They have been working day in and day out for the last several weeks, um, providing incredibly valuable uh, patient care, life-saving care, and to have an additional surge on top of it is incredibly um, frustrating, I'm sure, for them after they have worked so hard. So um, we will continue to provide support um, to our health hospitals and healthcare systems around the state. I think you're aware of that um, we contracted in over 600 uh, medical uh, uh, specialists and nurses, and um, we still have ongoing 1,500 National Guard members um, to support our hospitals and our long-term care facilities. We are coordinating that care at a statewide level to make sure if more beds are needed in uh, rural Oregon that folks can be transported to uh, other hospitals that may have some bed space. So no, I'm gravely concerned. I am um, pushing forward on our uh, vaccine requirements for healthcare workers because we have a really stark choice right now. A vaccinated workforce that can continue to work through our COVID surges like the one we're likely to see again from the Pendleton Roundup and or um, an unvaccinated workforce that's depleted by quarantines and illness. So yes, I'm incredibly concerned. I, I guess, you know, looking at OSCAP this morning, I think you've got five ICU beds uh, east of the Cascades. You've got one in Region 7, which is basically Central Oregon around St. Charles um, Hospital out of 54. Uh, I just, um, I, I was expecting something more, I guess, uh, uh, today other than the, uh, the, the, the booster news and things like this. You're not planning on taking any uh, state actions um, on these things. And I'm going to have to ask, do, did you make a mistake or did somebody make a mistake in allowing the Pendleton Roundup to go ahead as it did? Uh, so Gary, let me be really, really clear. We have some of the strongest safety protocol in the entire nation. We are requiring uh, masks indoors in public places, um, like the letterbox room, right? When people are not actively drinking and eating. And we are requiring uh, masks in outdoor locations. If you watch an Ohio football uh, game in Ohio, those stadiums filled with 100,000 people, there is hardly a mass there. That is very different here in Oregon. Um, but at some level, and particularly in terms of events like the Pendleton Roundup or um, a, a U of O uh, duck football game, um, it has got to be, individuals have to be uh, responsible. And I have asked Oregonians time and time again uh, to be considerate and kind to their fellow Oregonians. The level of burden that we are having in our state right now in terms of infection rates, um, that's why it's um, challenging to keep kids in schools in some of these districts. Um, it's so incredibly important for Oregonians to wear masks and to get vaccinated if you haven't done so already. Uh, Director Banks, would you like to add anything? Sure. Thank you for the question, uh, Gary. 
and and for raising the sense of urgency that we do have, particularly in low vaccinated communities. In addition to the safety measures that the governor talked about, um, it's not lost on us that where we're seeing some of these spikes are also in communities that have low vaccination rates. Um, I can say that I know that the public health workforce in Eastern Oregon is working extremely hard. I personally, along with Dr. Seidlinger, meet with them every month to hear how it's going. Um, and, and I know that they are doing everything that they can, but it really is incumbent on Oregonians to get vaccinated and be wearing those masks uh, indoors and outdoor in uh, crowded settings. If I, if I could just uh, chime in here, uh, Gary, I, I, I did not mean to imply that we were not seeing a, a spike in cases in Eastern Oregon. We, we certainly are. Um, I just was trying to emphasize that it's, it's a little too soon uh, to really see the full impact of some of those events. Um, and then also in terms of hospital capacity, as, as, as you've heard um, and you've seen, we are concerned about that and, and we're seeing um, more of a flat trend or even a slightly increasing trend in some of the Eastern Oregon hospitals. Um, and, you know, I've heard personal stories uh, recently of, of people's loved ones um, who uh, needed high level care, um, who would have to either forego that care uh, in Eastern Oregon or be flown to somewhere else, which is really what we're trying to avoid here. Um, so just to reiterate, reiterate the importance of uh, supporting our healthcare system and, and everybody doing their part by getting vaccinated and wearing masks. Thank you, this Gary. This uh, actually, actually answer the, the, the questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll let it go. Thanks, Gary. We have time for just two more quick questions. So we'll go next to Ariel uh, Yakobazi from KZI. Go ahead, Ariel. You almost got it there, Charles. Good job. Um, hi, guys. I tried. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. It's a lengthy last name. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank everybody for you know answering questions and being here today and um, yeah, answering our questions. So my question is, you know, um, we tried to do a couple a couple stories on this, but you know, haven't really succeeded. Um, why has testing for COVID nineteen, like you know, going to the pharmacy to get a test, um, become so scarce in the state over the past few weeks? You know. Um, you can get those at home testing kits, but for those who want to set up an appointment at like, let's say a pharmacy or like a CVS pharmacy or a Walgreens pharmacy, um, it's a few days of a wait for them to get vaccinated or tested, excuse me. Um, do we know why that's happening? Uh, Director Banks, can you pick up that question, please? Sure, and, and Dr. Jean, please feel free to chime in. I mean, we have seen uh, a variety of shortages in testing that relate to supply chain and other issues. I know we've been in conversation uh, with the Centers for Disease Control and, and the White House uh, there, as, as we've heard uh, several of weeks ago, part of Biden's administration plan was to increase testing and to, to understand the supply chain um, in there as well. So, so those are some of the issues that we're keeping our eyes on. Dr. Jean, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, you know, um, th things were, were looking so good early in the summer, um, and, and I think that really affected the supply chain for tests because companies that produce tests uh, made some decisions back then that we're still dealing with today. And so there is a national uh, shortage of some of the tests. And also, we're, we're in the midst of our largest surge ever in the pandemic. You know, we're almost two years in, and this is the largest surge. And people, so people are getting tested because they have symptoms, because they are exposed. And so that uses up a lot of tests that um, that, that just make it harder to have them available in, in pharmacies and communities. Um, but but it, it is something we are working on because uh, uh, testing is an important part of, of, of our response for, for sure, both for the public and for individuals. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ariel. We have time for uh, one last quick question. So we'll go to Amelia Templeton with OPB. Go ahead, Amelia. Yeah, my question is about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Um, Governor Brown, what is your plan to get a booster for yourself, given that that vaccine has been shown to be less effective for people of all ages? And sort of second, isn't that the core equity issue here? Shouldn't we be really advocating for boosters for people who got the least effective vaccine and who may have gotten it because it was a single shot and it was more convenient for them? Thanks, Amelia, for the question. Uh, I, uh, along with millions of other Americans, am really grateful to have received the J&J &J vaccine. And um, I am 
seeing and hearing at the national level, uh, medical experts and healthcare professionals doing the research needed to determine whether uh, those of us who got a J&J &J vaccine or frankly the Moderna um, will need to be boosted. Um, and obviously we're waiting for additional data and research on the Moderna vaccine as well. Um, so I am waiting for our uh, national experts to uh, determine that uh, folks like myself uh, need to be boosted. And I'll turn the remainder of your question over to Dr. Jean. Thank you, Governor Brown. Um, I, yeah, that's exactly right. It's really a case of we have to follow the data. And uh, Pfizer has been out in front uh, with, you know, getting the studies done and, and submitting data to the FDA so that the FDA and, and CDC and, and other experts can review it. Um, I, I believe that um, the Moderna and J&J &J vaccine um, uh, booster studies are, are underway, and I think it's just going to be a question of time uh, in, for those companies to get their data submitted so that we can um, have authorized boosters for them as well. And if I could add in regard to the equity part of the question, which I always uh, really appreciate, I think one of the things that we don't want to lose sight of is that we're still working diligently to get those folks who haven't gotten their primary, their first or second, if it's uh, Pfizer or Moderna or the one J&J &J dose. Those are the folks who are at, by far and away at, at, at an increased risk. And we know that we have inequities there along um, geographic and along racial lines. Thanks, Amelia. Um, that's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.